Hello, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, some of the uh, less commonly encountered uh, neoplastic uh, lesions in the uh, colon. Um, I've grouped them into the stromal and hematolymphoid uh, tumors. We'll again try to focus on diagnostic issues, uh, staging issues, and some of the differential diagnoses that they may arise. Um, to make things uh, maybe come into focus a little bit uh, more clearly, we'll start with some of the rarer lesions. Um, uh, we'll start with the ditzels, the lyomyomata, the perineurioma, granular cell tumor, and so forth. Uh, I've talked elsewhere about uh, stromal tumors in the GI tract, specifically GI stromal tumors. Uh, and then we'll touch on um, uh, the lymphomas and lymphoproliferative lesions that we can encounter in the uh, GI tract. Uh, first off, I'd just like to point out that uh, there are a number of uh, wonderful resources uh, dealing with mesenchymal polyps, uh, mucosal defined lesions. Uh, and if you look in the comments below, I'll post this link there as well. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Montgomery has got a great presentation uh, to the uh, AREP uh, meetings in Utah that uh, was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, thorough and comprehensive, very helpful on this topic. Uh, other lesions, uh, you, the kind of lesions that we encounter in this situation are the ganglio uh, neuroma, neurofibroma, lyomyomas of the muscularis mucosa, of course, uh, fairly common, uh, granular cell tumor, less common, perineurioma, Schwann cell tumors, uh, both schwannoma and uh, mesenchymal or mucosal Schwann cell hamartoma, and then uh, lipoma, lyomyosarcoma, and so forth, less uh, commonly encountered uh, malignancies and so forth. So here's a nice example from the textbook uh, showing the uh, 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 morphology and location of neurofibroma. Note that this is really not too much of a mucosal lesion, that it tends to be focused in the wall, uh, which as you'd expect, uh, because uh, that's where the nerves uh, tend to live. Uh, higher magnification of these lesions uh, can show you that uh, they have a very uh, typical uh, spindle cell morphology that tends to interlace uh, betwixt and between uh, the smooth muscle. So this can have an appearance of a, uh, a malignancy. However, the cytology tends to be very bland. And of course, the uh, uh, mitotic rate would be low. Uh, of concern here, of course, however, is the fact that these things can uh, 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 give rise to uh, a peripheral nerve sheath uh, uh, tumors, or excuse me, to malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Uh, as a possibility as well. Uh, another entity that uh, can be more mucosally uh, defined uh, is this one. Uh, and I show it to you at low power to give you a couple of uh, uh, caveats here. First notice, notice it has a sort of a um, uh, plexiform pattern uh, with uh, numerous uh, branches and cords and so forth of tissue. Note that it has associated lymphoid inflammation. Uh, so this can be a uh, um, mistakenly overlooked uh, in a superficial biopsy where maybe you just have a few portions of it. Uh, this is a granular cell tumor. Um, and here you see uh, characteristic higher magnification. Uh, you have gotta be appreciative for the granular nature of the cytoplasm in these uh, lesions. Uh, otherwise you may miss them. Now they can have a slightly spindled architecture as well as this more uh, uh, granular, rounded uh, uh, pattern that we see here. <clears throat> Another lesion that uh, can be somewhat challenging is the uh, perineurioma. Uh, and here you see, again, it's locali localized in the uh, mucosa. It tends to displace, but also to interlace between and around uh, colonic crypts. Um, and it can have somewhat of a fascicular pattern. So it enters into that differential with granular cell tumor, mucosal Schwann cell hamartoma, um, and um, um, the uh, neurofibromatous lesions that we've uh, already looked at. Under the microscope at uh, higher magnification, one of the distinctive features of this lesion is its tendency uh, to be associated with uh, serrated type uh, uh, mucosal hyperplasia, either in the form of a serrated uh, hyperplastic polyp or potentially an adenoma. Uh, but here you see the stromal proliferation and the serrated mucosal change. So the caveat or the, uh, the pitfall here is that we just see 
the mucosal hyperplasia and ignore uh, the underlying uh, stromal uh, spindle cell lesion. A similar lesion uh, that can be uh, uh, quite fun to encounter, uh, but somewhat subtle, uh, is the mucosal Schwann cell hamartoma. And you again see this uh, spindle-shaped uh, architecture interlacing between and around uh, colonic crypts. Uh, so there's uh, considerable overlap in these uh, lesions, uh, and that's where immunohistochemistry comes in handy. Uh, in the case of the mucosal Schwann cell uh, hamartoma, these are strongly S100 positive, whereas the perineuriomas uh, may not be. Um, there are uh, several other things that can be considered in the differential, and uh, we tend to use a panel that includes S100, uh, designed primarily for the mucosal Schwann cell hamartoma, but can also pick up uh, uh, schwannomas as well as ganglioneuromas. Um, CD34, which uh, may be positive in GIST, um, and of course helps you to also consider solitary fibrous tumor. Uh, GFAP, which would be positive in ganglioneuroma. Uh, EMA, which is an important distinguisher between perineurioma or schwannomas uh, with the mucosal Schwann cell uh, hamartoma. SMA for the smooth muscle tumors and CD117 for your uh, uh, GI stromal tumors. You could, of course, add other things to that uh, panel, but that's uh, the one that we tend to use most frequently. Now, leiomyosarcoma is a rather rare in the uh, GI tract, but uh, can occur, certainly. We have a lot of smooth muscle there, and uh, there are uh, enough exposures that it does uh, occur. Uh, in this situation, it looks like a stromal neoplasm. It's in the wall. It doesn't uh, seem to uh, displace or invade the uh, mucosal surface unless it's secondarily ulcerated. Um, and the cytology, of course, is going to be uh, usually more high grade than most GIST tumors, although it can be in some epithelioid uh, uh, GIST tumors fairly high grade. Um, and again, your immunohistochemistry for uh, smooth muscle markers, Desmond, myogenin, and so forth would be helpful in this differential. Uh, turning to some of the lymphoproliferative disorders, Hodgkin's disease uh, is an uncommon but not uh, uh, never encountered uh, uh, lymphomatous lesion in the uh, GI tract. Um, it can present as a mucosal ulceration, uh, giving you uh, the appearance of a potentially reactive appearing uh, stroma. Uh, however, uh, if you go to higher magnification and see the mixed nature uh, of the infiltrate as long with the characteristic uh, uh, Reed-Sternberg or Reed-Sternberg variant cells, uh, you should be able to identify um, lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's disease would be extraordinarily rare in the uh, uh, colon, and so I, I don't even include that in my differential here. Uh, Rosite Dorfman disease uh, has been described. Um, it's not, again not frequently encountered, um, and the morphology tends to be similar to what you see elsewhere, uh, but the challenge, of course, is to recognize it. So uh, what you'd expect to see would be uh, clusters of lymphocytes and areas of more pale cells, uh, which represent the uh, histiocytic component of this disease. Uh, and with that, you would then see the imperipoesis, um, the uh, lymphocytes uh, involved with the, uh, in involving the cytoplasmic uh, spaces of the uh, larger histiocyte uh, 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 cells. So the challenge here, of course, is to recognize that it can occur uh, and to think about it. Uh, the presentation, of course, is, uh, is not particularly uh, specific. Systemic mastocytosis is another entity uh, in the hematologic realm that can uh, uh, be deceptive. Uh, it can present as prim primarily mucosal lesions uh, and have the appearance of a uh, somewhat uh, uh, inflammatory type of change. Um, uh, we will usually see a great number of eosinophils associated with this lesion, as you can sort of see here at low power. Um, and so we may be tempted to refer to this as simply an eosinophilic gastroenteritis. However, uh, there is a second population of cells here, and they tend to have somewhat ovoid, uh, sometimes horseshoe-shaped uh, uh, nuclei, 
and a fairly pale uh, pink cytoplasm that may be slightly granular. Uh, so again, thinking of it uh, and then uh, doing your appropriate markers uh, to uh, confirm that that's exactly what you're seeing. Here, CD117 is positive in these cells. Uh, again, another reason why that uh, marker is in our panel. Um, these cells, of course, would also express other mast cell markers like tryptase uh, and uh, CD25. Now, another mesenchymal lesion that we may encounter is the uh, intraabdominal desmoid. Uh, this tends to be a more uh, extramural, sort of adventitial type of lesion, but especially in patients who have familial adenomatous polyposis, uh, a mesenteric fibromatosis uh, can be uh, uh, frequently encountered. Um, and so uh, that is uh, something to bear in mind if you're dealing with uh, uh, that entity, uh, or uh, certainly to look for and consider foci of that type of disease uh, when you are evaluating a patient who's been resected for uh, 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 familial polyposis. Uh, the morphology of these is, uh, of course, similar to the uh, features of fibromatosis that we see elsewhere. A loose, fairly cellular spindle cell proliferation, a uh, little bit of fascicular pattern, uh, and of course, uh, characteristic uh, reactivity with uh, beta catenin uh, would be expected. Uh, one of the things in the differential with that uh, intraabdominal desmoid is inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, uh, which will tend to have more inflammatory component, but may also have this uh, uh, spindle cell process. Doesn't, uh, it tends to be a bit more eosinophilic, a little more fibrotic uh, than uh, fibromatosis is. Um, and here you can see this mixed uh, character of the inflammatory uh, process along with the uh, spindle cell uh, characteristics here. Uh, many of these uh, uh, tumors would be uh, positive for uh, ALK uh, protein as well on immunohistochemistry, but the immunoprofile is uh, not always specific. You might also see some uh, myofibroblastic markers like uh, uh, some desmin or a little bit of smooth muscle actin. Uh, further into the mesenchymal lesions that we will encounter is uh, angiosarcoma. Uh, both the conventional angiosarcoma and, as uh, uh, on occasion, Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, this lesion, again, can appear fairly mesenchymal, uh, not terribly hemorrhagic at times, uh, because the uh, endothelial cells can develop a, a more solid type growth pattern. However, in some areas, you should see a sense of uh, uh, angiomatous uh, type uh, involvement with uh, interstitial type hemorrhage, or little uh, intracellular canaliculi uh, that are filled with, uh, with uh, red blood cells, uh, as you can see here, uh, poorly formed vessels and uh, active uh, mitotic activity. Uh, another, uh, again, rarely encountered entity is the uh, perivascular endothelial cell tumor, or PCOMA. Um, these can occur in the gastrointestinal tract, just as they can in the kidney or the uh, lung or uh, the uterus. Uh, and they will tend to have the uh, characteristic um, somewhat mesenchymal appearance with a moderate degree of pleomorphism, uh, generally slightly uh, pink and granular cytoplasm, uh, which you can see here uh, with a tendency towards granularity. Uh, and again, immunohistochemistry is going to be uh, needful to uh, generally pin down these lesions and differentiate them from epithelioid leiomyosarcomas or uh, epithelioid gist tumors. Plexiform fibromyxoma is an uncommonly encountered lesion, uh, but does have, again, a very descriptive name. Uh, so uh, if you see tissue like this, you're going to say, well, that kind of looks plexiform, and it is rather myxoid, isn't it? So uh, you may very easily stumble upon uh, the diagnosis without even knowing it. Uh, in the differential with this lesion, however, of course, would be things like endometrial stromal sarcoma. Uh, these tumors both can have a very delicate uh, vascular pattern, uh, and the differential would, of course, uh, be uh, helped by uh, the absence of uh, any evidence of uh, hormone receptor positivity um, and uh, potentially uh, uh, sex of the patient, uh, as well as uh, potentially other markers. Um, these uh, tend to be more benign lesions. 
uh, but uh, their behavior can be variable. Turning out to other lymphomas, uh, having left behind Hodgkin's disease, uh, in the large bowel, uh, rather than most commonly finding uh, maltomas and so forth, uh, it may be the diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the more commonly encountered uh, disorder. Uh, some follicular lymphomas uh, or follicular transforming to a diffuse large B uh, can be encountered as well, uh, as in some patients, uh, Burkitt's lymphoma as, uh, as well. But with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, we tend to have high grade. Uh, uh, lymphoid type cells with a characteristic uh, centroblastic type of uh, nucleus uh, and uh, moderate amounts of cytoplasm uh, infiltrating between the uh, uh, colonic glands. There's not a high tendency to invade the epithelial compartment uh, and of course the immunohistochemistry uh, will be uh, confirmatory for you. Uh, there are a number of syndromes where you can have multiple uh, uh, polyps within the uh, colon that are actually uh, lymphomatous uh, polyposis. Uh, here, here seen uh, in a nice uh, gross photograph from the Mass General. Um, and under the microscope, they can appear somewhat just like uh, sort of uh, exaggerated uh, lymphoid aggregates. Uh, you see here there's not a really destructive invasion of the wall, but they tend to be mucosa associated uh, with a very pronounced hyperplasia. So uh, differentiating from, from mucosal hyperplasia may be, may be difficult. However, many of these tend to be uh, uh, mantle cell lymphomas uh, and therefore have uh, both the characteristic sort of intermediate grade nuclei with some uh, uh, grooves and, and so forth, as well as uh, cyclin D1 positivity. Again, your uh, immunohistochemical profile will help you to define this uh, as well. And if you have an access to a, a, an adept uh, hematopathologist, I'm sure they will be uh, more than eager to help you out with this uh, uncommonly encountered uh, variation. So let's turn briefly to the neuroendocrine tumors of the colon um, and talk about uh, those. Uh, this is not a lengthy topic. Uh, but the story is similar to that which we see elsewhere in the GI tract. Uh, we have, first of all, the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which uh, currently uh, fall into the, uh, uh, the uh, grading schema that uh, has been proposed elsewhere of three grades. Um, <clears throat> but uh, probably the more common site for them in the colon is in the rectum. Uh, again, these are uncommon to metastasize. Uh, but their immunohistochemistry can be somewhat confusing. They can have CEA, they can have PSA. Um, of course, because they're hindgut uh, variants, they may be chromogranin negative. Um, and uh, uh, they can even occasionally be uh, uh, positive with other more concerning markers. Uh, larger size, uh, of course, may occasionally result in the need to uh, do a more extensive uh, anterior posterior uh, resection. The poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas uh, are uh, more commonly associated with conventional adenomas or carcinoma. And therefore, uh, these often fit into the mixed category of uh, neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine uh, tumors. Uh, still, these are very rare, but you should keep them in your mind. Um, and especially if you're thinking, well, could this be melanoma or metastatic disease? Uh, these, uh, these can be a little bit challenging immunohistochemistry because you can get uh, variable uh, aberrant uh, seemingly uh, markers like uh, TTF1 and so forth. So uh, that's a quick run through on uh, some of these lesions. Uh, we'll try to put some uh, videos up with uh, case examples of certain, these, certain of these entities to help you get uh, more practice in looking at these slides. But at this point, thanks for joining me for this short talk. Uh, and if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we welcome your comments. Uh, and if you like it, please share it and subscribe uh, so that you won't miss future videos as well. And uh, till then, uh, keep things in focus, and uh, we'll see you next time.